There we go. So uh, Melissa and I were talking. I'm like, okay, what should we talk about today? What's going on in the world of the internet? What's the prevailing thought? You have your thumb on the pulse of everything. And uh, <laughs> she said, I don't know. <laughs> so we began to discuss it. And <laughs> so we, um, we, we settled on the Alva Small. There's a, um, and there's a reason for that too. And, and I think it's important to understand um, a lot of what I do in the AFA as a Gothi is, is the, is real world stuff. It's doing a funeral, it's doing a wedding, it's counseling, it's, uh, it's holding the ceremonies. It's the real world kind of application of this faith that you don't get with, uh, with a lot of other things. And you most particularly don't get it with, uh, with, you know, for everything that I say about the Theodish and some of the, and other, and basement dwellers and your turkey neck beards that I kind of have, that's why I have a beard so you can't see it. But uh, there's a real overriding emphasis that these words, you know, we, we've read it, so we have this understanding. And if I could recreate the situation, I'll have the most accurate kind of portrayal of what it means as if the actual role play might create the kind of might provide that justification for living such a radically different lifestyle because i mean on in all honesty we got to be asking ourselves that okay we've decided to change everything about who and what we are we've decided to go with this radically different mindset spirituality blah 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 we've become a the shining example in the lives of everyone around us of what it means to be a little bit different, to follow a different spiritual path. And for a long time, it has been that, well, I've understood the heathen worldview because I've read Rudolf Simic and I've sat down and studied this and, and, uh, and I, I have a more complete understanding of the etymology of this world. It's just really just, and it drives me insane because there's no real world application for that shit. You read all that you want. And here's, here's the thing to remember. By the middle of the 17th century, at the height of the Victorian age, right, you had, had a number of individuals. There were a thousand different books in publication at that time concerning Northern lore, Northern Norse mythology, um, all of that stuff that we study today. A thousand different books at the height of the Victorian age. And every single one of them was written with an idea in mind of justifying the PC climate of the time, be colonial expansion of Europe or whatever political mindset or certain ideas of nationalism to build national pride, so on. Or they were written by the academic who wanted to show with disdain just exactly how much smarter he was than everyone else. So you ended up with, at the height of the Victorian age, a thousand different books. That's the middle of the 17th century. A thousand different books that say, yes, this was here. And there was all kinds of wild nonsense that went with it. And these are the books that people are using to tell everyone else that they understand the heathen worldview. Well, if you're writing a book in the Victorian age, you're not going to write anything that makes the Church of England and the King's agents or the Pope and his agents think that you're not Christian enough. See, just 50 years earlier, they were still burning witches at the stake. Right, that's exactly right. So, we're supposed to believe that because you read that book from the 17th century that you might know more than I do about this going on? How so? How's that work? This is what I always say, what's when the uninspired and the uninitiated begin to tell everyone how much they know. Well, we have an example of what that looks like when the uninspired- I told them to tell the, me to help. When the uninspired and the uninitiated show up to talk about the lore or take a seat at the table that they haven't earned or they haven't been able to justify. And it's called the Alva Small. When a person who thinks that they have an understanding of everything that's going on because, well, they've read all of these books and they seem to think they know what's going on, um, and they have a right to marry, take the hand of Thor's daughter. That ain't how it works out. So 
The Alba Small is an interesting poem. Let me give you a little foreword on it, okay? The Alba Small is uh, no better of the summary of the Alba Small can be given than Gehring's statement that it is a versified chapter from the Skaldic poets, poetics, the native skeleton. So instead of reading what it says, they focused on the structure of what it says to make sure that it's real. Okay, the narrative skeleton contained solely in stanzas one through eight and 35 is of the slightest. The dwarf Albus is desirous of marrying Thor's daughter, is compelled by the God to answer a number of questions to test his knowledge. Isn't that kind of what a lot of these academics are trying to do? They're being compelled to answer these questions so they might engage in a divine marriage of spirituality? Because that's what I see. <clears throat> It's kind of an egotistical idea, isn't it? Well, I know, I've, I know more than everyone else. Therefore, it justifies my radical departure from the other 7 billion people in this world. All these 7 billion other people, they seem minus 10 million or so pagans throughout the world and the billion Hindus. They all seem to have a pretty good grip on things but I know more than everyone else, so I'm going to change that. However you may have been called to show up here, however, whatever brought you to this spirituality, yes, there's a lot of things to learn. You're unlearning old things and learning new things, but that's just a small part of what this spirituality represents. They open little doors. But the incorporation of, of into that of who you are is a much different process. It can't be based on ego or spending all your time worried that, well, I might not know enough. Somebody might make me look stupid. What if he asked me a question about that? And I, I watched Dave Martell get his butt whipped by a Christian minister in a debate because he didn't know enough. He couldn't provide proper justification through academic means. So we have a great failure there which is no surprise, <laughs> but, but I digress. That all his answers are quite satisfactory makes no difference whatever to the outcome. Think about that. That all his answers are quite satisfactory makes no difference whatever to the outcome. And I think there's a lot of academics that fail to grasp that very simple point. You might know all of those answers. You might be able to quote uh, Simic. You might be able to say why Sophus Boog called this a, uh, that uh, the, the law is too heavily Christianized. Well, at that time when Sophus Boog was a monk or a priest or whatever he was, um, if you deviated from the church, the church was the beginning and the end. And, and but here's the problem. He failed to take into consideration that the oral tradition of this lore is far, far older than the written tradition of the 2,000 years of Christianity. But if you said that, if you said that out loud, you'd be in a lot of trouble. So we have people still believing it. <laughs> the questions and answers differ radically from those of the Vafthruth Nismal. This is one of the four question and answer scenarios where they talk about the basic framework of how the universe is created. There are four of them, the Vafruth is small, the Alba small, the Grim is small, and uh, I think the Veluspa. Instead of being essentially mytho mythological, they all concern synonyms. So we're learning about the Kennings. Thor asks what the earth, the sky, the moon, and so on are called in each of the worlds. Everyone has a different perception of these things based on how they, where they live, how they interact with the world they live in, or how much they are separated from the world they live in. <laughs> but there is no apparent significance to the fact that the gods call the earth one thing and the giants call it another. Well, sure there is. One group of individuals is fully incorporated into the world that they live in. They are entirely material. Another group begins to separate themselves from the world they live in. They're not part of the world they live in. They're building great cities and the center of their universe begins to revolve around their ability to survive in that city instead of surviving in accordance with the way the world operates. That's an important distinction that people fail to remember. The answers are simply strings of poet, poetic circumlocutions or kinnings. 
concerning the use of kinnings in scaldic poetry, uh, there's an introductory note in the Hymiskvitha. Hymis so the poem is dated to the late 12th century, assigning it to the period of Icelandic Renaissance of scaldic poetry. The 12th century, no one ever talks about the fact that there was a Renaissance of prose and poetic of scaldic poetry in Iceland in the 12th century. Everybody knows about the Renaissance in France. But our ancestors here in Iceland were cultivating high marks in poetry that people fail to recognize. But let's get on with it. Alvis spake. Now shall the bride my benches adorn and homeward haste forthwith. Eager for wedlock to all shall I seem, nor at home shall they rob me of rest. When you look at that poem, so he's already saying, he's challenging Thor right then and there. So this dwarf, this individual, this uninspired and uninitiated individual, meaning he has passed no initiation to determine if he has the qualities to say the things he's fixing to say. He is uninspired beyond the idea of his ego. He simply thinks that, well, I know enough, uh, I, the world shall be mine for the thinking. I can think a little bit better than everyone else. Uh, even though I work uh, after five o'clock, I'll be able to hold bloke because I'm doing this simple factory job right now. The best thinking he could come up with hasn't resulted in success in any other kind of manner other than his ego says, well, you know enough, you should have the hand of Thor as your daughter. That's a hell of a thing to jump up there and say, isn't it? Yet being uninspired, lacking humility or any kind of other proper sense of self, he just goes for it. I admire the audacity and the boldness, but I find a great fault in the egoic thinking pattern. And I see it at fault, and I see it in a number of individuals who feel like they can, and I'm going to say it, they try to think, well, I can outthink Brian Wilton. Who does that dumb redneck think he is that he's, he ought to be blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. Thor spoke, and this is the warder of men. What prey art thou? <laughs> I so pale around the nose. By the dead hast thou. Hast thou lain of late to a giant that, like, dost thou look me thinks, though wast not born for the bride. Thou wast not born for the bride. So right away, <laughs> he gets insulted, like any good father should. So this entirely unworthy suitor shows up at the door, not a member of the Aesir, not a part of the tribe, not anyone who has done anything to prove himself. What the, who the heck are you? I'm kind of pale around the nose. And you're awfully pale. Why, you, you, you hang out with the dead? It's like a goth dude trying to date a, uh, <laughs> a, be a surfer girl. It, no, it doesn't work. It's not how that's going to work. You know, that pale and pure nonsense you get with the gothic crowd ain't going to go so good for that girl that likes to hang out by the beach and do a little surfing. No, there's no appeal there. And the father's responsibility in all of this, in raising a home and raising a daughter, is to say, no, nah, you get out of here. He starts by insulting him, but he's not to be deterred because he thoroughly believes he knows enough to justify this place at the table. He thinks that he has understood or learned enough that, well, I'm more than worthy. Oh, how so? He tells him, Alvis am I, and under the earth, my home neath the rocks I have. Now, Alvis means all knowing. Okay? So he's got himself, he's changed his name on social media. <laughs> And while he lives in his mom's basement. Right there you have it, folks. <laughs> the bride in question is Thor's daughter, Thruth, which means might. So if you're living in your mom's basement, you're kind of got that pasty look around, you know, you're kind of not cool, and you want to go marry a woman whose name means might. You might be shooting a little too high, a little bit out of your league, a little bit out of your class there. But be that as it may, he's going to give it a shot. So, with the wagon guider, a word do I seek, that the gods their bond not break. No. So you're going to all of a sudden take call the warder of men, the the wagon guider Thor, who travels habitually in a goat drawn by a wagon. Um, he 
Alvis is so full of himself, he doesn't recognize who he's talking to. So immediately he calls him and says, let the gods not their bond, let the gods their bond not break. What bond would that be? This is the warder of men, not the warder of dwarves. Thor spake, break it shall I for over the bride, her father has foremost right. At home was I not when the promise thou hadst, and I give her alone of the gods. And that's an important thing to note. It's the father's decision in this day, in that time. When a woefully unsuitable individual shows up to make a deal with the divine, you can know all kinds of things. But there are certain divine aspects you're going to have to contend with. Not the least of which is have you cultivated the gifts of, who you, of what you have to become what you're supposed to become, to stand in front of the divine. I see all kinds of guys. Well, I stand in front of my gods. Oh, have you done everything you can do to become what you're supposed to be, become? Have you cultivated the gifts you've been given by Odin, Vili, Ve, Rig, Rig, Freya? Or have you simply thought yourself to the top of the heap? Have you simply thought, well, I know enough. I ought to have that. I live in mom's basement and I just live in, or I hang it, blah, blah. <laughs> There's an important distinction there that a lot of people need to wake up and smell the coffee on. It all started with somebody said, all oh, true is the religion with homework. Mm. Thor says, no. And that's exactly what happens when we entreat the divine to become a part of all this and we haven't become physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually powerful enough to stand in front of our divine beings there's going to be someone that has to make a decision. It isn't until Jarl learns the use, learns the language of the birds and the use of the runes that Rig steps forward and calls him as his own. There's a pattern there that's repeated. And Alvis is trying to jump ahead of that pattern of struggle, of pain, of growth by simply reading about it. Alva spake, what hero claims such right to hold over the bride that shines so bright? Not many will know thee, thou wandering man. Who was bought with the rings to bear thee? So he's asking, who's his king? Who are you? Who are you wandering around? Thor just told him, I, alone, I give her alone of the gods. He just told him, I'm her dad. And Alvis, not willing to understand that he is looking in the very face of that which he cannot measure up to, he decides to fall. He's going to double down, as it were, on how smart he is. <laughs> Thor spoke, Ving Thor the Wanderer, wide am I, and I am Seath Grini's son. Against my will shalt thou get the maid and win the marriage word. He tells him, you're not going to get it. You're not worth it. So <laughs> there is a note there that apparently the gods promised Thor's daughter marriage to Alvis during her father's absence, perhaps as a reward for some craftsmanship of this. So there is that possibility. Um, perhaps this dwarf made something special for the gods, but and, you know, even in the Codex Regius, I think we're mixing two books, possibly three, and there are various other aspects of what we are missing in this lore. And, and this lore is where it all comes from. You, you could read all the books you want to, but if you don't understand this lore, you're not going to go very far. So, Alva spake, thy good will now shall I quickly get and win the marriage word. I long to have and I would not lack this snow white maid for mine. So he's going to try to do it. He's going to say, he figures, you know, he's bold. He, think, he thinks it's rightfully his, as do many men who think they understand what they've read of someone else's interpretation as they parrot some 17th, 18th, or 19th century scholar concerning this lore. They think that they are more than qualified to step up and say this or that. They will win the, mar win the marriage word. They think they're qualified to stand up and be considered a part of this spirituality. And... Really, all they've ever done is provide a book report. 
nor spake the love of the maid, I may not keep thee from winning, thou guest so wise. If of every world thou canst tell me all that now I wish to know. So this great traveler, this wanderer wide, Thor, who rolls across the earth, this god of the storm, this hurler, this great hurler of weapons, this wagon driver, he's probably been and seen and done it all by now. And he has full right to just slap the piss out of him for showing up and uh, insulting him and any kind of other, all kinds of other nonsense. But he doesn't. And that's an important distinction to make. When the discipline that comes with being a warrior becomes fully apparent in the mind of Thor, who has typically been portrayed in the lore as this very powerful, belligerent, um, almost out of control powerhouse. In this moment, when it comes to his daughter and his family, he steps up to the plate as that disciplined individual that is worthy of respect. He could smite him in an instant. He could call a storm or tornado or whatever and whirl him away. He could smash him with a hammer. He could kick him into the fire as he did at his brother's funeral, the other dwarf that happened to run afoul of him. But this one, he's going to question and answer. He's going to make a decision, an intelligent decision. Answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all. So Alvis means all-knowing. Dwarf of the doom of men, what call they earth that lies before all in each and every world? What is, so that's an important thing. So he's asking him, not just tell me about Midgard, tell me what it means to everyone that lives here. What are all these different realms look like? Earth to men call field. To the gods, it is the ways it is called by the wanes the ways, evergreen by the giants, the grower by elves, the moist by the holy high ones. And each one of those is vitally important to understand. To the men, it is the field. That's the source of their food crops. That's where their cattle range. That's where their livestock lives. <laughs> it is the way by the wanes, the Van Air, those great earth deities. This is the way you live. This is the way you will survive from all the generous earth. Evergreen by the giants, those simple beings that even live under the rocks that are completely consumed by materialistic ideas. It's evergreen, a verdant countryside of Northern Europe that was always fertile, full of abundance, fish and nuts and roots and fields and crops and all of these things stand in stark contrast to the barren, dry deserts that uh, you could die standing if you stood in your front yard too long without any water. The grower by the elves. Those elves of light, it simply grows. And what does any thing that lives do? For all of us, we get confused and distracted by all kinds of things and we stop our emotional development, we stop our spiritual development, and we stop our mental growth because we get tied up on an issue or we get distracted to the left or to the right. But these trees that are behind me, they might suffer a lightning strike or an infestation. They don't stop, they don't slow down, they simply know one thing to do and that is to grow. When the acorn gets in the, in the ground and it begins to meet with all of this wonderful competing complementing energies of water and nutrients and it begins to crack that hard shell from that point on, from that point of radical change in birth, the only thing that that tree knows how to do is grow. Doesn't matter what's going on in the world around it, it grows. Doesn't matter if the sun is shining or the sun is not shining, it grows. The elves recognize this fact. And we should recognize that as well. The only thing we need to focus on is growing, becoming more. That's how we make the most use of these gifts we've been given, of good sense, goodly color and hue, and breath, owned ah, la, and lethal gota. The moist by the, high, by the holy high ones. Now, I don't know which ones he means by the holy high ones, the moist, but that's an important consideration to take into, into thought is that the moist means water. 
That's Lagu's, folks. That's the interconnectedness of all things. It reminds us that we are no more separate on this ocean of life that flows across the surface of the world than a wave is from the ocean. We are a part of it. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they heaven beheld of the high one in each and every world? Alvis spake, heaven men call it, the height the gods, the wanes the weaver of winds, giants the upworld, elves the fair roof, and dwarves the dripping hall. Men call it heavens. Men have always raised their eyes to the heavens. It has guided them in just about everything they do, when to plant crops, when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, when to raise children, when to, when to sow, when to harvest, the heavens, the stars and everything else. The height, the gods, is simply the height, is simply the higher place. The wanes, the weaver of winds. So it is up above that the, for the wanes, these great gods of the, of the earth, the vanic deities, this is where the winds go, the winds that provide that breath. It's like a fish don't know that he's wet. We don't understand the medium through which we travel. Yet if you stop breathing, you're done. If we slow our breathing down and we control it, this weaver of winds and how we weave them into our body is what, allows, what determines how well we survive in life. Giants, the upworld, the simplistic being simply doesn't comprehend. There's something that's not in front of his face. He doesn't really get it. Those people with a low general IQ don't understand the concepts of delayed, gener of delayed gratification. If it's not happening right now, they don't understand. For the giants, it's simply the upworld. The elves, the fair roof, that protection from on high. What an important concept to consider, and perhaps it's one we should be thinking of too. I hear a lot of people say, well, the gods really don't give a shit about us, and yet when I look through the lore, I see them providing example after example of how to deal with all of the situations in life. I see them dealing with all of them, providing us an abundant source material of what to do. I also see them providing us but a plethora of gifts and the dwarfs, the dripping hall. And once again, we have an idea of water. So we have all of these concepts tied into the idea of heaven. We have all of these concepts tied into the idea of, of the earth. Many different faucets of the same thing. Many different ways in which we might perceive what's going on in front of us. Thor spake, answer me, Albus, thou knowest all dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the moon that men beheld in each and every world? So the moon controls. Moon with men is flame. The gods among the wheel in the house of hell. The goer, the giants. The gleamer, the dwarves. The elves, the teller of time. I've spoken on that several times, but the lunar and solstitial alignments of so many of the monuments around the entirety of the world in these ancient archaeological ruins is of, a, of an astounding amount of importance. Time was told by how many moons we have 13 four week periods in a year. There are, this is the moon, how many moons have passed? Well, we have a, a moon for planting, we have a moon for hunting, and we still talk about it today on social media. We have a great super moon and it's going to be a harvest moon. We know when harvest, well, sure enough, it's about time to harvest. All these tractors are in the field picking what they need to pick. With moon is the flame, that light in the dark, that shining object in the night that helps men to see. Moon with men, flame the gods among. Moon with men, flame the gods among. So the gods called it a flame. Man, I'm drawing a black, but whatever. The wheel in the house of hell. And that's important to consider too, the wheel in the house of hell. So in the house of hell, when all of these are passed, these, are they counting these moons or is it simply rolling across the sky? Because at that time, it went under the earth and it rolled back to the star and came up again and tried it all over. It is the wheel. It never ceases to move. It's, that stands for Brideho, the journey. And, that, and there are a few things, as I said, that determine the tale of time, like the moon. How many moons has a man had? How many moons will a man live? 
It's the wheel that tells exactly when he will join them all in that house of hell. The goer, the giants, simply going across the sky, it's like one of those dumb rednecks or a slack-jawed yokel down there in Alabama. Well, it's just kind of going over this way and that way. It's, eh. So that's kind of, kind of the way I see giants, those simplistic materialistic individuals, the gleamer, the dwarfs, it would shine in the night like any of the jewel the dwarves are supposed to hoard, the elves, the teller of time, and they get right down to the bottom of things. It is the teller of time. I don't need to call it anything fancier. It tells the time. And at some point, we understood that in spades as we built all of those great uh, 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 stone structures and megaliths and temples that lined up with the moon at certain periods of the periods of time. Thor spake, answer me, Albus, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the sun that all men see in each and every world? Albus spake, men call it sun. Suna, they call it the sun. God's the orb of the sun. Because there's a little bit of a difference there. They're separating the deity with the chariot that she drives. Apollo had the same thing. Well, Apollo wasn't exactly the, the, the sun god. He simply drove the chariot whose wheels. And before him, it was Helios. And before, and you have to remember that Balder is also a solar deity. And in some cases, Frey is also a solar deity, these gods of the sun. So there's many representations of the good that that light brings to the world that the light brings to the world. So it is simply the orb of the sun to the gods because they know one step beyond what we seem to know. The deceiver of Dvalin, the, the dwarves, because dwarves in sunlight, they die, they turn to stone. They're not meant to be in the sun. It is a deceiver. It's a bright shining object that dwarves would, uh, that dwarves would love to have in their possession, but it's a deceiver. It kills them every time. The giants, the ever bright, they always, the ever bright, it's all, whenever it's shining, it's shining brightly. Probably something they don't much appreciate either. Elves, the fair wheel, all glowing, the sons of the gods. So that's a different character of being right there, the sons of the gods. Where do they come from? Who are they? For the elves, it means the fair wheel because that fair wheel drives all life on this planet has the, and may destroy it at some time. But that warms the water, that, um, that powers the trees, so to speak. It is the fair wheel. When that gentle shining light shines upon the fields and they turn green and they begin to grow and they begin to thrive, what a wonderful thing. So it says right here, there's a footnote that flame is a doubtful word uh, Big Fusen suggests that it properly means a mock sun. Wheel, the manuscript adds the adjective whirling in the destruction of the meter. So it's supposed to be the whirling wheel and not the fair wheel. But since they're trying to recreate the structure of what it is, because it's a 12th century Icelandic skaldic renaissance, remember, uh, they're not worried about what it really means. But to us, <laughs> all of these things suggests that there are many different aspects how the sun interacts with everything on that planet and few things are is it more distinct than with the sun men call it the sun gods call it the orb of the sun There's something else in between that and this the deceiver of the for of devaling the dwarves the giants the ever bright elves the fair wheel all glowing the sons of the gods many different perceptions of what the sun can do it is a giver of life it is a taker of life it provides a source of energy for all life, but if you stand in it too long, it will burn you up and kill you. Okay. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the clouds that keep the rains in each and every world? Alvis spake, clouds, men name them. Clouds. Rain, hope, gods call them. That's where your rains come from. It's a reminder from the divine that you might have you. It's okay to enjoy a little hope when you see those clouds begin to gather on the horizon. The veins call them the kites of the wind. Flying a kite, about as simple as it could be, but it's the most romantic kind of way I can think of it. 
Water hope the Giants once again. Lagoos. So right after that sun, we have this idea of the clouds, the thing that blocks out the sun and provides that water that is an important ingredient to all life on earth. Weather might be elves. The wind, it can also, provide, especially around here in Oklahoma, you get a tornado coming, everybody's paying attention. There's some weather might in that, I assure you. Same thing for hurricanes. The helmet of secrets in hell. Well, what kind of helmet of secrets in hell? What, that, what might that mind? The helmet of secrets. Whose helmet? What helmet do they wear? What secrets do, does it possess? And it creates no shadow when the clouds are out. Supposedly this is when the gods might walk the earth. It's an interesting thing and perhaps worthy of research if you'd like to look into it. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the wind that widest fares in each and every world? Wind do men call it? The gods, the waverer, because few things will cause the courage of a man in a ship to waver like a high wind. Few things will make a man doubt himself than standing near a tornado. You will waver in the face of that kind of energy, I assure you. <laughs> the nayer, the holy ones. And I'm not sure what that means, so I'm not going to talk about it. The high holy ones call it the nayer. The wailer, the giants, that sound that the winds make during the storm, it would sound like a wail. And those simple people that are terrified, that huddle under their rock shelters, the wailer would be a, a most terrifying aspect. The roaring winder, the elves. In hell, the blustering blast. So what would the wind look like in hell? It would be the blustering blast, roaring winder. All of these are interesting perceptions of on the summer day, what a gentle breeze might be most pleasurable, but at its highest intensity, it can be a truly terrifying thing. When hurricanes roll through Florida or typhoons roll across the South Pacific, um, it can cause a great deal of fear. People always want to denigrate that too until it's too late and the roof of their house is blown off and everything they own is soaked with water. So the waverer, the word is uncertain, but the blustering blast and two Prosetta manuscripts give it a totally different word meaning. It means the pounder. So the blustering blast also in other Prosetta editions calls it the pounder. The trees are uprooted and the earth is pounded with hailstones. Hagalah is the bringer of radical change. None of these great storms just kind of walk in there of their own accord. There's a great wind that blows those clouds that build up those high and low pressure systems that bring these storms that create lots of energy and create radical change for any small village that happens to be in the way. Hagalah. But it's also that seed of life. So you can't completely negate it. Thor spake, answer me, Albus, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the calm that quiet lies in each and every world? Calm, men call it, the quiet, the gods, the wanes, the hush of the winds. The sultry, the giants call it, so it's going to get hot. The elves, the day's stillness, the dwarves, the shelter of the day. So now, now that the wind has quit blowing, it's calm. It's a peaceful, tranquil time. That kind of time in the evening when the sun starts setting and it's kind of shining through the trees and you see the little sun ray shining on the dust and the, it's hanging in the atmosphere. It's my favorite time of day in the evening. The quiet, the gods. And the quiet is an important thing because so much of what they're talking about and what they've created it has to do with waves, sound waves, waves of energy, the quiet. Nothing's happening. The hush of the winds, the Hispanic deities, once again, call it simply what it is. The wind has stopped blowing. The sultry, the giants, it's going to get hot during that time when there's no cool breeze to cool off those individuals that live out in the forest or in the hills or in the woods. It will be sultry. Elves, the day's stillness. The elves, as usual, put it in the most romantic of terms, the day's stillness, a wonderful golden time that is my favorite in the morning or in the evening, it matters not. 
dwarfs the shelter of the day. That's that transitional time when they can move about, I suppose. Thor spake, answer me, Albus, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the sea, whereon men sail in each and every world? Albus spake, the sea the men call it. God's the smooth lying, and it is a deceptive thing. You might sail across there on smooth as glass sea, but there's no wind to push your boat. Now you're going to have to work your butt off and row. And if you sink, if you capsize, if something goes wrong, Ran is waiting there with her net. So all of that promise of treasure and conquest uh, might come to an end in a second. The smooth lying. The wave is called by the wanes. Those great waves. The eel home, the giants. Probably the nastiest thing I can think of. Eels are just disgusting to me. <laughs> it's not a snake. It's not a fish. But it's as gross as both, I suppose. It's an eel. Uh, and it will shock, and some of them will shock you. Isn't that great? Hmm. The giants figure that out. Drink stuff, the elves. Well, yeah, that's where our water is. This is La Goose. This is the perception of La Goose, the sea, the ocean, from all of these different realms. The sea, the smooth line, the wave, the eel home. Drink stuff, the elves, for the dwarves, its name is the deep. I suppose that if you lived in rock, swimming probably wouldn't be at the top of your athletic capabilities. Yeah, it's going to be deep because you're going to find the bottom when you sink. <laughs> Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the fire that flames for men in each of all the worlds? Fire, men call it. Kenaz, this is the torch of inspiration. This is that torch that provides that all of our ancestors possessed back to the beginning that show us the source of illumination and inspiration. Flame the gods. By the way, this wildfire call. Well, of course, these Vanic deities are not going to appreciate fire. Wildfire burns out of control. Ask any of California what that means. The biter by the giants. It will bite you. I mean, it's like the joke my, my father told me when I was a little child. He said, you ever seen a match burn twice? Well, he lit it and I watched it burn, then took it out and he poked me with it and he burnt me. So yes, it burns twice. It is a biter. The burner by the dwarves. Simple enough. But the burner for the dwarves, that's also the, where they smithy everything. This is the burner. It burns metal. It burns people. It burns everything. It's the burner. The swift in the house of hell. For those few that were unfortunate enough to get out of the way of the wildfire or the biter or the burner or the flame or the fire, it caught them and swiftly ushered them into the house of hell. Thor spake, Answer me, Albus, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the wood that grows for mankind in each and every world? The wood that grows for mankind doesn't grow for the gods, doesn't grow for the giants, it grows for mankind. Men call it the wood. Gods, the main of the field. The seaweed of the hills in hell, flame food, the giants, fair limbed of the elves, the wand, it is called by the wanes. The main of the field. There are a few things that are more attractive to the eye than a beautiful, lush field surrounded by those beautiful trees that grow in the fence rows. The seaweed of the hills and hell. Um, there's really no perception upon this flow of energy, this sea of life that flows across the land than the sea of life that flows across the ocean. It's just a different species. All of it is a flow of energy and life. So in, once you pass through and you inhale in this afterlife, whatever the halls of your ancestors might look like, your perception of the flows of energy and life across the surface of this world are going to be different. The seaweed of the hills. What a wonderful, beautiful kenning to illustrate that ability to perceive a great many more things after we make that transition into the next world. We're only able to see in this form 2% of the, of the energy that flows around us. And we see that as a stunted view of perception of light and color. After you pass on, what a wonderful illustration of the answers you might have access to at that time. Flame food, the giants. Well, yeah, you need wood for your fire. Fair limb to the elves. They see beauty in anything that struggles to grow, anything that continues to grow without ceasing. 
It makes it fair limbed. The wand, it is called by the Waynes. They're going to use it, the magical ability of that people. Thor spake, Answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the knight, the daughter of Nor, in each and every world? Alvis spake, Night men call her, darkness gods name it, the hood, the, high, the holy ones high, the giants, the lightless, the elves, sleep's joy, and the dwarfs, the weaver of dreams. Simply night. But she has a persona. She has given birth to children, various children in the lore. Hail the day. Hail the sons of day. Hail the night and her daughter now. Well, the night's daughter is the earth, Yord. Darkness, God's name it, kind of like it is now. The hood, the holy one's high. That simple covering of so much, like when you wear a hat or a hood, all you're doing is covering that abundant source of energy, thought, and creation we know as our mind. It is the hood. The giants, the lightless, simple enough for them. The, the romantic term for the elves, sleep's joy. What a wonderful time thing to get a good night's sleep. And for the dwarves, it is the weaver of dreams. Perhaps she does that, have that capability to weave those wonderful dreams that allow people to determine what their futures might look like, what dreams they might hope for. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the seed that is sown by men in each and every world? Uh, there's a footnote here on night, nor presumably the giant whom Snorri calls Norvi or Narfi is the father of naught or night and the grandfather of day. So night, so the night is the mother and then you have day, the, the son. I'm sure somewhere else it's differentiated much more. Alva spake, men call it grain. What we work for, what we live for, what we eat, grain. And corn, the gods. Now, I highly doubt that, in, well, it might have been. Corn, the gods, growth in the world of the Wayne's growth. The substance, that's an interesting thing because they call it grain and the gods call it corn. That seems like a very Native American kind of thing to me, doesn't it to you? Because I'm not so sure that corn was that big of a crop in Europe until after the Spanish began to take a look at uh, Central America or South America. Unless, of course, there was a much earlier, a much earlier adventures into North America that we don't know anything about yet. Like the Peterborough Petroglyphs, the Evening Roomstone, so on and so forth. Then corn would be an important part. Or perhaps maybe that's where they originated as people migrated following these flows of energy. So corn. Growth in the world of the vein of the wanes. It's growth. You gotta eat it to live. Your ability to grow it successfully means you're learning something, means you're getting better. If you want to grow enough to feed yourself and your family and your tribe, you better grow up, and figure it out. The eaten by the giants, the gluttonous idea of, they simply refer to it as the eaten, something that's already passed. That's the complete alignment of the egoic mindset with the ideas of consumption. Drink stuff by the elves. Them jokers are making moonshine. They ain't bullshit nobody. And hell, the slender stem. And it is a slender stem because if you have multiple failures of agriculture because of some weather phenomena or a volcano or a meteorite and you got three years of bad crops, um, all of a sudden there's going to be a lot of your friends and family trotting that door to Hellway. A slender stem indeed. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the ale that is coughed by men in each and every world? Ale among men. Beer the gods among, in the world of the veins, the foaming, bright draught with the giants, mead with dwellers in hell, the feast draught with Sutung's son. So ale among men, ale or mead, all these drinks that provide intoxication. But there's more than just alcohol in those drinks, I assure you. Beer the gods among, and I'm sure at some time that the Oktoberfest, this huge festival with beer, all kinds of beer. A good brewing of beer. <clears throat> In the world of the Wayne's, the foaming. And a good foaming head of beer is awesome. The bright drop with the giants. 
It's a golden drink. Hold it up to the sun. Unless it's Guinness, then you got yourself a nice, good stout. The bright draught with the giants. So whatever the case may be, once you drink it, you're going to feel pretty bright. Mead with the dwellers in hell. So it's an entirely different substance there between ale and mead, between the living and the dead. So mead with the dwellers in hell is an entirely different drink. The feast drop with Sutung Sun. So those spirits of fire, it is the feast drop. After the great burning of everything, the, it's what you drink at the banquet hall. That's what you drink with the feast. Interesting that fire is such an important part of that. You can't make ale or beer without fire. You can't make it without certain grains. You can't make moonshine without fire. You can't brew these things. Mead, you can do all of it with. So these dwellers in hell that don't really have access to fire, maybe that's what they have to use. But heat's an important part of all of it. Thor spake, in a single breast, I have never seen more wealth of wisdom old. But with treacherous wiles, hmm, I just saw something made me change my mind about everything I just said, but I'm not going to do it. The feast drop was Sutton's son. I forgot Sutton is the possessor of meat of poetry. God dang it. <laughs> In a single breast, I have never seen more wealth of wisdom old. So obviously I would not be getting Thor's daughter's hand in marriage, but, but with treacherous wiles must I now betray thee. The day has caught thee dwarf, now the sun shines here in the hall. And just like that, everybody that thought they knew a bunch of stuff and jumped up to the front of the line because I understand the heathen worldview and I have read a few more things than you and I, I oh my gosh, I understand that. The sun is shining and you're uninspired uninitiated ways are now going to fall by the wayside as you turn to stone and understand all that shit's worthless if you can't understand how to stay out of the sun. Which is typically what we get with individuals who jump on there um, because they've read some important work. And there you have it, folks, right there in our own lore. A reminder that you might think you know everything, and you just saw somebody do it, <laughs> you might think you know it all, but that ain't ever the case. So don't think you can jump up there to the front of the line because you read one more book than Brian Wilton and might understand it a little bit better than he does, because honey baby, I'm here to tell you, it's not the case. Um, but we need to remember that also when we make appeal to the divine. As we begin to develop this spirituality, you can't write a book report and jump to the head of the class with development of your spirituality. And I see people failing to understand that. That research is vitally important. We need to know that archeology. span We need to know all of these things. But that doesn't mean we get to, uh, you can't determine the quality of someone's also true based upon whether or not they've read a book you've read or haven't read. I think that's about all I'm going to talk about right there. I feel pretty good about it. So if you guys want to unmute your mic, you have any questions or concerns or want to chew the fat, I am, I'm here for you. Ugh. Thank you, Brian. Thank, Thank you. you. For that. <laughs> Thank you. See there. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I feel better. Yeah, I do feel better. Thank I you, feel, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think that was pretty, uh, thought that was pretty funny that you made a mistake like the dwarf did right there at the end. That was, uh, was I think it was awesome. perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, it was 100% on point. Oh, Lee, imagine if I'd have been important. <laughs> <laughs> what I would do with myself. Then that's how it goes, guys. I mean, sometimes you, sometimes you do, but that's, I mean, that's my biggest problem with a lot of this stuff that's going on. Is everybody thinks they can read one book and have a pretty good handle on it. Man, this stuff is so deep. There's so many perceptions to it. There's so many different ideas that go with it. If you can't apply it to your life, if you can't figure out how to use it to, 
raise a child in this world, if you can't figure out how to build a partnership or a relationship, I mean, what are you, what, what are you doing? I mean, that's, I mean, that's what we got to be asking ourselves. Can I use this in some way? Can I use this to become something better? Because believe you me, once you start loaning a little bit of it, like I just did, it's real easy to boost your ego and say, wow, now I'm a little bit more important than you because bullshit. That's not how it works. But you still have people trying to do it, feeling like they've uncovered some special thing and now have a appropriate philosophy. And I, I see people saying that, I don't think you even understand the definition of the word philosophy. But that's neither, that's neither here nor there. There's some people I could really make fun of. But matter of fact, I probably will later on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think I've, I've brought it up before and I'll bring it up right now because it, it's relevant that there's a there's a group online called also true and there's yeah. a guy in there and he's always he's just a dick <laughs> no matter what anybody says he's always right you can't beat him and his reasoning for that is that he has been studying and reading books for five years <laughs> <laughs> five years that's incredible yeah, right. Wow. You know, this is legitimately his excuse. He has been reading for five years, and um, he is a like historian student or something. So therefore, he is the biggest authority. And um, uh, when he tells you you're wrong, you just need to learn how to be educated and accept his his uh, correction to your thought process. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I would love to see. There's. <laughs> Melissa, you just, you throw that out there and it just kills me because the only thing I want to say is, you know, what if, you know, a real woman would understand her place, but I guess, because I'm, I'm going to reach out to him and tell him to say that. I'll say, look, man, you're right on the money. You know what you need to do? You need to tell those women to know their place. Woo, come on. I can't wait. <laughs> well, I had I to get out of that group, though. I couldn't take it anymore. I was like, I just... I was trying to like meet up with the people on there that, you know, we could come to some common ground on because a lot of new people get in there and they're like, oh, I've been wrong all this time. I'm like, no, these guys are messed up. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, the, that's the real thing though, isn't it? Is that, is that once we, <laughs> it's, it's really scary to be out here and trying to believe in this stuff on your own. And then it, so, Especially when somebody, if you tell someone, well, I worship, you know, the old gods, I, you know, Thor and Odin and Freya and Frigga and Sue. Oh, yeah. And somebody, yeah, I, and somebody and, yeah, and somebody, they won't take you serious. They're going to laugh okay. in your face. And, and they, and, you know, I'll knock him out. Oh, why? You're the one standing there looking like a dumbass. Right. So and here's the a, thing. We don't have a cultural, you know, connotation anymore. Well, as they did in the past. That you're right. There's no cultural connotation, but there's also a real risk because we have to ask ourselves, are we living that kind of life that would, when they look at it, they got to say, well, shit, he might be on something. I don't see a bunch of us that are millionaires. I don't see, I know a couple of business, successful small business owners that are doing very well using these principles, but by and large, who are we? We're simply average people trying to make it in this world, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So, so now all of a sudden we've got to provide, it's a real scary thing and it's a real need to protect the perception of who we think we are. That's our ego. There's a real need to protect that. And if we can't do that, then what, then, then why would we want, why would we risk being made fun of all the time? Who wants to stand at the edge of the crowd? Who wants to be vulnerable? Who wants to not be taken as seriously? So when we join this, I mean, we got to work twice as hard as the guy next to us to ensure that, yeah, I am real. I am the real deal. To earn that respect. When people go out there and start leading with the chin about who they hate or what book they've read, they're not doing themselves any favor. They don't understand they're being brought to scorn by their own pot bellies. And when they get online, they're going to protect that. They're going to do anything they can. They will hurt people. They will lie, cheat, steal, do whatever to protect that image they've created of themselves. And then what? Then what are we left with? Now we're left with a dickhead talking about everything he thinks he knows, trying to be an example of what all this can do for you in your life. 
Are you manifesting miracles in your life? Are we? Are we living that life that's giving a proper justification for such a radical departure from faith? I mean, these are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. And the problem is when somebody says this is a religion with homework and all I got to do is study and I can think to the front of the class, never mind if there's any success in my life or not, never mind if I live in absolute squalor, I know a little bit more. I can continue to feed my ego and feel important. So that's, that's my whole gig with all of it. People, I want to see that. That's why I want to see people successful. That's why I won't put up with someone that shows up saying, well, I've made sacrifices. And, hey, people got upset because I made fun of that guy sent me that, that weirdo message. But at some point we got to start speaking truth to bullshit. And I got that from Brene Brown, one of the most liberal authors you can come up with. But she's not wrong. Speak truth to bullshit. At some point, we're going to say, wait a minute now, that, that's not going to do anybody any good. What the shit does it matter? If you have 100,000 people on your Facebook page that like mm -hmm. what you're saying because you dislike the Jews on the world or these black people are doing this or Antifa's doing that, that doesn't mean jack shit to 7 billion people that live in this world or even the 370 million that live in America. Doesn't mean anything. What matters is the success of our lives. And you're not gonna get that kind of success if you're sitting around talking about it on social media. Make sure everybody understands how right you are. That's my point of all of this. And it just, it sticks in my car every day kind of example are you setting? What kind of success do you have in your lives? Do you have, do you, do you have money in the bank? Can you pay your bills? Can you feed your family? That's my point of all of it. Sitting around talking about it in mom's basement or, or finding some, we understood, we found some special secret book and I've got a failed alt-right talk show host really promoting everything I do. Um, you're not, uh, you're not helping matters. Or some joker in South Indiana, making sure he understands he's got to educate the world about the real deception that it's a destruction of the white race. There are 850 million white people in the world. Are you gonna round them all up and kill them? I don't, I don't want to hear it. I want to see success. You want, nothing breeds success like success. You're not going to think yourself into it by whatever book you read. And I get tired of it every day and every all the time. See, I'm a little bit of a dick about it. But man, at some point, we got to start standing up to people and saying, hey, um, what good does that do anybody? What good does that do anybody? Is that going to help you become better? Is that going to help my daughter integrate into school? Is that going to help uh, a new school after we've moved cross country? But you got to be asking yourselves, we got to start being serious about this. We're going to start taking this as legitimate spirituality and faith and rebuild that cultural context that we don't have right now. And we're not going to do it by subscribing to the lowest common denominator. We're going to do it by making sure the people around us are just as damn successful as they can possibly be. Oh, you need help with doing this? I got you. Oh, you need help with doing this? Oh, you're going to try? You know what? Kevin James, or not, is it, who's that guy that did uh, Silent Bob? <laughs> Kevin Smith. <laughs> Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith, yes. Kevin Smith said one of the wisest things that I ever heard. He was talking about the death of his father. He said, hang out with why not people. And I've used it a hundred times. Hang, hang out with why not people. He said, if you're, he said, well, I think I'm going to make a movie. If he'd have been hanging around with people to say, why do you want to do that? Nobody else is doing that. You can't do that. What makes you think you can do that? You don't know enough to do that. But he was sitting around with a bunch of buddies and said, you know, why not? Hang out with why not people. You want to go build a business? Why not? Go give it a shot. You want to write a book? Why not? Go give it a shot. You want to marry the person you love the most in this world? Why not? Go give it a shot. Hang out with why not people. What could we achieve if we hung out with why not people? Well, 
you're hanging out with people that understand the heathen worldview more than you do because they've read Rudolf and Simic and Selfish Book mm -hmm. and all these other, um, boy, you can't really do that because you don't understand it. Well, oh, why should I hang out with people like that? I want to hang out with those people that say, oh, you want to go, you want to build a multinational million dollar corporation, import, export? Why not? Let's give it a shot. And then help that person do it. You know, let him be a millionaire. The only thing this world is ever going to respect is money. You can build, you can build, a, you can be as spiritual as you want to be in this world, but sometime somebody, near, you, the bills come due. Sometime you've got to pay the electric. Doesn't matter how spiritual you are. I can sit in there and write books all day long about how special I understand this integration of Thor and Alvis. At some point, I've got to pay the electric bill. You know what I mean? And that's what, uh, I don't care, you know, I sell a hundred, I sell a hundred thousand books. That doesn't mean anything if none of those hundred thousand people haven't become something fucking awesome. And right now I can count several of them that have. That means something to me. That's an obligation I take very seriously. And when I see a threat to it, I'll stand up against it. <clears throat> Damn, that's a pompous fucking thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> it's all right. Anybody got any questions? I'm off my tangent now. I'm off my soapbox. I feel pretty good. I'm awesome. Thank you. Much needed. Somebody's got to say it. No. The problem is, is the people that usually show up for these things are the people that are on the same path. We need to figure out how to get it more out there, I guess. <clears throat> oh, that people watch them. People watch them all over the world. Yeah. But yeah. you're right. You get pretty good hits on watching them afterwards, the recordings, I think. I do, but you know, I, I want to see those people be successful. And that, and that's, and that's what's going to happen. Is anything I said going to help an individual be successful? Is anyone, I, anything I said going to help someone maybe put their ego in check and, um, Shit, that success might simply be being a better spouse today than you were yesterday. It might simply be being a better daddy today than you were yesterday. It might simply be being a better friend today than you were yesterday. Those little bitty steps of success, it, it just keep trying. But when we sit down and, and read, well, I've got it all figured out now. I think I understand it. Um, And it's not really getting us anywhere, but I see, I see, uh, I see people trying, you know, and I think that's got to count for something, don't y'all? Oh, yeah, sure. I personally have seen Tony, Hell yeah. I've seen Tony come a long damn way. I hate to call you out like that, bud, but I'm going to because I've seen, oh, you yeah, come go a ahead. Long way. I've seen you come a long way from where you were when we first met. You, you've dealt with a lot of issues, man. Yeah. I've seen Heather do it. I've seen Matt do it. I've seen Melissa do it. I've seen several people that I know and care about come a long way trying to do this. And <laughs> it's time to start speaking truth to bullshit. When I see somebody send me a message that says, I've made sacrifice, and would you make sacrifice too? And no, motherfucker. Anyway, we've had Sacrifice a lot of people. Important, but it, it can't be the only thing that you're basing yourself off of. Sacrifice isn't going to give you a personality. It's not going to. It's not going to build you a home. It's not like sacrifice is. In a lot of ways, sacrifice is one of the most important things that we could um, potentially utilize. But it's not the only thing. By a long it, That's the that's the lesson of the Heindel Yoth otters. Altar stone was grown to glass with blood and fire for the offering she'd made to Freya, asking for that miracle. And she got a, a, a giant test to tell him, look, buddy, you got what it takes to do it. And that's the whole thing. We've got to remind each other, you have what it takes to do it. And, you know, the ego is the one thing in the world that'll tell you, it, it'll tell you that you don't have it. No, oh, you ain't got no ego. No. Really? So, 
I'll, I'll give you, for instance, in my own life. So last year I was working for Salisbury and I made $102,000. This year, I started out in February. I was laid off because they closed that, gener that division. I started off, um, that all kind of went away. I had a job opportunity here that didn't go through. I had a job opportunity here that didn't go through. So finally, I had to take a good long look at it. And I took a job as a helper, a helper at $12 an hour. Oh. Now, mind you, I still, and so there's a lot of crow to eat that. From a guy that's gone from making uh, six figures to a guy that has to go out and start at $12 an hour. I assure you, one of the things I had to eat was a lot of crow sprinkled with a lot of my ego because now all of a sudden I'm not as important as I thought I was, was I? I'm right so there with you. I had to go, yeah, I had to go through it. I had to go through it. And now here we are in October and I've moved myself up to, you know, foreman and field superintendent and running these jobs and, you know, doing a substantially better than that. Um, but that, that was, um, if you're sitting there thinking that everything you've read is what makes you what you are, where's the courage to go out there and eat that crow and try to become something better? Where's the courage to let go of something? Because I know a lot. I'm a published author. Everybody around the world knows me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm working for $12 an hour. Um, you, it, it takes a lot of courage because you've got to be real honest with yourself at that point. And the honest fact of the matter was at that point that the best thinking I could come up with, the very best thinking I could do, put me in that situation. And that's, that's the truth of the matter. And when it comes down to those kinds of things, the best thinking I could come up with, well, shit, now what? I guess I better do the best I can with what's in front of me, because that's the best I could think of. And when you start to approach things from that point of view, all of a sudden, all the things that you know or you think you know, well, they're really not that important, except I'm gonna do the best I can with what's right in front of me in this moment right now. And you know what? That's when shit starts changing. That's when those miracles that everybody talks about start happening. That's when you begin to grow. That's when you begin to develop. Phil's still struggling, but that's, they'll get taken care of. And I think people are afraid of that. And, I, and there's a, I think that was one of the, one of the best lessons Austria ever taught me. And I did learn it in also true. I can think my way to the front of any room I want to get into. But when it comes to living life, I got to learn how to put the rubber to the road of these things that I'm writing about, that I'm talking about. And that means doing the best I can with what's in front of me. So that's what I did and that's where I'm at. <clears throat> so I, I, when I see people trying to sidestep that process of growth as if it's legitimate and tell everyone else how stupid they are on some kind of social media, I see through that like a puff of smoke. And I, I, I believe in it 100%. You do the best you can with what's in front of you because whatever's in front of you is the best you could think of at the moment. You don't like it, change your thoughts, and change your reality, which I had the option to do at any given time. Could have gone back to school. I could have polished up my resume and sent it out to many different locations, but let me see what this path has to offer. <coughs> so that's what I've done. And I've seen, I've seen a lot of you guys, I've seen a lot of people that I know do just that thing and no one's celebrating that i've seen people deal with cancer i've seen people deal with loss who's celebrating their ability to stick with the foundations of their faith and move forward that's my that's my thing doesn't matter if they've read uh rudolph simic or the otis book that's just such a dumb name <laughs> <laughs> Otis is the name to bring back to the ground, man. <laughs> <laughs> Otis is the name of a slack jawed yokel in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, guys. I'm just going to tell you. Just every time I see that, I'm like, oh, boy. that's my hometown. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. This I got a lot of family down there. <laughs> I I spent most of my life down there. Okay, uh, I, mean, yeah. I, I spent a good eight, nine years, ten years almost. Well, that big dairy, that big dairy on the right hand side of the road as you're driving to the river past the Mira home, past that nursery. My great grandfather bought that with a cotton crop that he that he got in the 1950s out in Sayre, Oklahoma. And um, yeah, gone now. Family sold it. Boys weren't interested in it. Anyway, anybody have anything else they want to add to that? Any kind of struggle they had to deal with and overcome? Well, a current struggle that I'm dealing with is really just trying to get the money together to put down on this truck so I can do an owner operator and put my wife through school and build my own business. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, and you're 20, how old? 24. Nice. See, that's, that's perfect thinking for your age. I mean, that's, that's exactly the way you should be thinking at 24. I mean, you should be thinking there's no limit. There's nothing that I can't do. I mean, literally yeah. at that, at that, and there's not, there's really not. I mean, if you, you keep working, you keep driving, you keep, just save that money. There ain't a, there ain't a damn thing on the shelf of any of those stores or Amazon that's worth your future. And that's what I see a lot of us trade our things for. Well, I, pro I probably need that. That's a nice wicker chair. Son of a bit. That's the nicest wicker chair I've ever seen. I probably better get that. No, yeah. no. Save your money. Save that money. Save it. Invest it. Put it in something you can't get out for three days and build your future. Yeah. That's how you we know, do the it. biggest, sorry, Brian. Uh, the biggest thing is, uh, you know, right now, financially, we're struggling a lot, even with me being over the road making almost two grand a month or two grand a week you know we're, you'll figure it out we're struggling and don't I use think, credit yeah you know and i think that financially going owner operator it's going to be the best move for us because i'd be making substantially more you know Don Ricardo says the survival podcast has great info on this stuff. And he's right. They do. They absolutely do. That's good stuff. What is that? The survival podcast. Uh, uh -huh. He talks about those kinds of things. He talks about, you know, built information of, you know, you don't need the wicker chair. That's funny. Right. That right. It basically covers, you know, um, what's his tagline again? Um, living your best life. If everything is goes right, or even if it doesn't or something according to those lines. Mm -hmm. Right, because and you know what? It's right because shit's going to change. If if no, the Lord doesn't tell us anything else, this is going to change. I don't care how, man. You can have a shit, Brian. House. You don't need the Lord. Look at Cali right now; it's burning down. <laughs> you're right, man. <laughs> if it's, they ain't prepared right. with some water and shit, they're fucked up. <laughs> you know, and it sucks too because I got good friends out there. I got people in the middle of that right now, and mm. Uh, mm. and they're dealing with it. I. Things are going to change, guys. I mean, it's just the way of it's the way it's always been, and you're right. I mean, that credit is a credit's a real difficult tool for people to comprehend. Um, they'll give yeah, you all is. of they'll give you all of it you need and a bunch of it you don't. And my my great uncle told me one time. He said, Brian, I can right now pick up that phone and borrow a heck of a lot more money than I need to do. He said, pay for it with cash as you go. Than I did for most of my life. I ruined mine at 18 with college loans and credit cards crawling out from it now. I, yeah. I'm in credit now or, or well, I'm helping people get out of debt. And it's such a, I hear these sad stories every single day. Oh, I broke my leg and, and then my credit card companies, they raised the limit without telling me. And now my interest rates are killing me. And, um, somebody else got a divorce and now the ex-wife crashed the car and, and now he's stuck with the charges and, and it, it all comes back to these companies that do not care about you at all. They buddy, buddy with you. 
all the way up to the point where you have a horrible tragedy fall into your, into your lap. And as soon as that happens, they turn their backs on you and say, no, you owe, owe us more money. It's the only industry where they can charge you more money for something you bought after the fact. It's utter crap. Yeah. Is. Right so, now. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Lane. Well, uh, I, I was going to speak on what Matt was talking about. You know, right now, you know, we're trying to get ourselves out of debt. You know, my credit alone is crap. I think the last time I looked at it, I was maybe 500, maybe. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't got a whole lot of college debt. My taxes last year took care of that, but you know, mm -hmm. I've got, I've got a car that I owed on. Uh, I've got an apartment that I own on, a couple phones. You know, it all just adds up after a while, and it's been tearing yeah. my credit down. That you is, know, uh, it's really funny. You guys were talking about all this credit thing, and I'm like repossessing cars while we're talking about this. You know, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> You're evil. <laughs> You are an evil um, man. I mean, I have I have That's literally crazy. repossessed three cars in this entire conversation that we've had. You know, <laughs> right talking and everything else. That's and funny. I just like you guys got onto this credit thing, and I'm like, whoa, that's just insane. But well, that's kind of hit I me think... a little bit. You know, I was like, man, that's kind of bad. I'm a dick. So, <laughs> well, you know, we got to make a no, living, but, you know. Good. I think that's the thing is we got to start looking at it from a from a smarter viewpoint, and and it's and it's and it's something we've got to cultivate. Um, we've got to begin to educate ourselves. I mean, it's real easy once we get into this lifestyle to want to uh, to do all these things, but we we find ourselves. I, I just know too many people that find themselves almost illiterate with regards to how to negotiate. Um, some of the financial world that we're expected to negotiate. And we have other people around us who are more than willing to throw us under the bus if they can yeah. make a dime off of it. And I think it, it, all of the tools are there for us to use. All of the tools are there for us to utilize if we could come to some kind of agreement on how to build that kind of wealth amongst ourselves as being something worth developing right now there's a lot of there's a school of thought well i'm happy i don't really need to do that but at some point we shouldn't we want to leave some kind of future for our children i mean all of the all of the rigs through these people all do better than their parents they all do something more they all cultivate something better um we just had in the probably in the, in the midst of it the greatest transfer of wealth this world has ever seen when the uh, the parents of the baby boomers began to die i mean literally trillions of dollars began to be inherited and the only thing that went up was the price of a house the price of a car every company in the world took advantage of it but yep. I, I think we got that's one of the things we're spending all this time educating ourselves on on some kind of book when we need to begin to understand okay I'm figuring out who I am. I have a healthy relationship with the divine. I feel emotionally stable. Now I've got to operate in this world I live in. How do I do that? When every time you turn around, someone says, well, you can't do that. They're dedicated to the destruction of the, of the wait a minute now. I like Disney, you know, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Okay. I'm not so crazy about a black mermaid, but you know what I do like? I like the dividends that stock pays me. I like it a lot. Fair point. And, and when I die, my children will each get some of that. Ah, okay. So now all of a sudden the tools are the, the resources that, that my opponents might be using against me. Wait a minute. I have access to them too. Yep. And it's a matter of using them. But you know, most of the time people show up here. Nobody shows up at the door of any church because everything's going hunky-dory in their life. They show up because something's wrong. There's some kind of something going wrong. Well, okay. How do we fix that? Well, we got part of it, right? Now let's build an individual that can walk down the street with his head held high. 
So he can oh. go ahead. Well, I just I wanted to bring this up because you know, Brian, we've had talks about this. We've talked with Everett too, and we have some ideas and things I've been working on with some mastermind projects. I actually did a lot of work on that today. So it's kind of fun that we're talking about this right now. Um, but you know, when we've talked about it, the thing is, is that everybody's so, it's almost like they think being financially stable um, makes you greedy and that they shouldn't want that and they should just be okay to be, uh, you know, getting by. You know, just, just, just pay your bills. But, you know, the other part they don't think about either is if you, if you don't get past that, you're not going to teach your kids to get past that. And then we're going to stay a fringe, we're going to stay a fringe group of people. That's what's going to happen. We're going to always be a fringe group of people because we don't have wealth and we don't have influence and we have absolutely no power as a people. And everybody wants to talk about our culture and we want to build things up. If you don't have those things, we're not going to go anywhere because nobody's going to listen to us and nobody takes us seriously. And you know, we have to absolutely. be together. You know, the Mormons in 150 years built a gigantic, that whole state, Las Vegas, all of the West. I mean, there's Mormons everywhere. Have you seen that temple? Have you seen yeah. these temples they put up all over the place? In 150 years. They built that, and they and they did it. All right, well, guys, I'm going to get off here, but I, I do. But that's something to consider. I mean, at some point, the, the Hindus have the clout they do because they contribute to political parties. At some point, it's time for us to begin to do the same thing. I think the state of Jefferson should be a pagan state. Yeah, <laughs> I think it should. I think we should all go out there and just take that son of a bitch over. Yeah. Yeah. Not included in that. We need to rethink that border. <laughs> I'm all with you there. Because I like my Southern California. Actually, I think we should like buy Baja. I think we should just buy Baja. You know, just make it a new vacation destination. Get we can do that. Yeah. I'm actually looking at property to buy right now. Little lots in Big Bear for five grand. What is oh, the name? What is the name of that place in? Uh, where you do your deal, the 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 uh, the Methodist retreat. What's the name of that town? Oh, Julian. Julian. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, Julian's nice. Yeah. It yeah. Is. yeah. First, you're in Big Bears in Northern California, right? Yeah, that's like more LA. It's like the the mountains that the like the Castaics. I would prefer that you got out of a tidal wave zone. Like you need to get you and, <laughs> and Gray and get your dumb asses out of that title bit because I worry about that shit. Man. You need to go to the mountains, go some, and just visit. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, Gray's in the Navy, so he's kind of stuck. As you know, can imagine. Yeah, but he's got he can get on the boat, swimming. man. He can he can swim. That son of a bitch. <laughs> Ooh, <yeah. laughs> yeah. Well. All right, guys. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You. Hey, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Hello, Odin. Hey, Hello, Odin. Everybody. Hey, Hello, Odin. Hello. Hello. Hmm. Later, guys. Y'all be safe. Later. We we'll see y'all.